And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. Today, we're going to be talking about how gut bugs, gut infections, and antibiotics may put stress on your mitochondria. So in today's podcast today, we'll put the link down below. We reviewed a couple of studies looking at different infections like H. pylori and different antibiotics. They have an effect on down-regulating your mitochondria. And your mitochondria is, is the powerhouse of your cell. It generates ATP, which is kind of the cellular currency in your body for energy. Uh, before we dive in, make sure you click that thumbs up button, that like button. Put your comments down below. If you're dealing with fatigue and gut issues, there may be a connection. Really appreciate it. So your mitochondria, right? It's inside your cell and it's going to help generate ATP. ATP is energy for your body. And we need mitochondria to do that. Now, we're going to generate ATP from acetylcholine, right? Acetylcholine is going to get made from carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And obviously, then it's going to go through uh, glycolysis where we spit out about 2 to 4 ATP. And then it's going to, um, let's see, yeah, 2 to 4 ATP on glycolysis, depending on how many pumps around. And then it's going to do about 31 or so ATP on the electron transport chain and beta, beta oxidation. And I think it's about 34 to 38 ATP total uh, throughout that whole kind of mitochondrial pathway there. And that's kind of our cellular currency for energy. That's going to give us fuel for our body. Now, there are different things that can affect that. So obviously nutrients play a big role. We need B vitamins. We need amino acids, magnesium. We need a lot of these. New carnitine plays a really important role in the mitochondria. So if we have a poor diet, we're not getting adequate nutrition or we're not breaking these nutrients down, these may all be a problem. Also, we talked about this in our podcast today. We'll dive in a little deeper. There's research out there showing that antibiotics can actually create oxidative damage and can affect the, the mitochondrial function. And mitochondria is going to generate ATP. So if you're this kind of person that's been on antibiotics throughout their life, that's going to do a couple of different things. Over time, it's going to create more mitochondrial damage, number one. Number two, it increases the chance of other types of dysbiotic and, and gut stressors to occur. So if we have dysbiotic bacteria overgrowth or SIBO, where the bad bacteria in the gut starts to predominate over the good, that can influence a lot of absorption. That can influence the absorption of nutrition. It can also affect good, healthy gut function. We may not be making enough enzyme and acid function. And we need good enzyme and acid function to break down, absorb, assimilate, and utilize our nutrients. So this is very important. I also mentioned the antibiotics can just create oxidative stress and affect the mitochondria itself. So if you go online and type in antibiotic and mitochondrial dysfunction, you'll see a lot of data on it. You can also just type in H. pylori and mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, part of the reason why these infections can create problems is, I think, nutritional deficiencies. I think they also can produce various biotoxins that can be very harmful for the mitochondria. Mitochondria is very prone for oxidative stress. There's lots of studies using different antioxidants and blueberry and turmeric and curcumin and and different polyphenols and, and grape seed extract. A lot of these polyphenols and antioxidants are very helpful at buffering stress in the mitochondria. So if you're getting lots of good whole food, nutrient dense foods, right? High quality grass fed animal beef, um, lots of organic vegetables, that's gonna help and give you a lot of nutrients to help buffer that oxidative stress. So think oxidative stress, think antibiotics, think mitochondrial dysfunction. Then we can also add in other things that are periphery to it, things like pesticides and various chemicals like that, um, heavy metals and mold toxins are also going to play a major role on uh, decreasing your mitochondrial function. So first thing we can do is make sure we have good health, gut health. So if you have any gut bugs, knock them out, address it. If you aren't getting exposed to good probiotics or good fermented foods, take some supplementally, bifidobacter, lactobacillus plus, and or just try getting some good, healthy, low sugar fermented foods, whether it's a low sugar kombucha, some sauerkraut or kimchi, start getting some fermentable foods. Try to avoid antibiotics as much as you can. Sometimes it may be necessary, other times not. So try to do your best to use natural things. And then if you need a big gun, then use it when needed, but try to avoid them in the interim. And then outside of that, have a robust diet. Try to add in some herbs and spices like turmeric, curcumin, cinnamon, right? Uh, organic fruits, low sugar fruit, organic high quality vegetables. These are all going to be loaded in high quality antioxidants, which play a really good role at helping your mitochondrial function. Probably one of the downfalls of a carnivore diet may be, maybe a lot of the 
lack of antioxidants. Now, if you're doing organ meats and you're doing high quality grass fed meat and you're getting actual organs in there, that's gonna help though. It's gonna really help buffer it because then you're gonna be getting a lot of the concentrated plant matter that the animals ate. So there's good ways to, to kind of handle it and, and you can adjust it accordingly. So again, mitochondria play a big, big role. And if you have any gut bugs, they could impair that extremely uh, efficiently. Let me continue to, to roll on this here. Could antibiotics affect neurotransmitters? Yeah, I mean, it definitely can because you need to be able to have good digestive function to break down your protein. So think of protein as like a pearl necklace. Think of the amino acids as the individual pearls. So you have to rip that pearl necklace down and break the individual pearls off it to be able to absorb the nutrients. So very important. You need good digestion to get those good amino acids. That's important. Also, when you have dysbiosis, um, you're not going to absorb a lot of your food well. Plus, you synthesize a lot of good like vitamins like vitamin K2 and B vitamins. You're going to synthesize that through good, healthy bacteria. If you have a lot of dysbiosis, you may not get that endogenous synthesis of good uh, B vitamins and good mitochondrial nutrients. Excellent. Hey there, Mary. Does NAC need to be taken at the same time with vitamin C to be effective? I don't necessarily see that. NAC is a good cysteine um, compound. Again, one of the master antioxidants, right? Glutathione. So what is glutathione coming from? So I talked about like oxidative stress, right? You get a lot of good antioxidants through plant-based products that are high quality organic. And if you have digestive issues, cook, steam, saute. But you're also going to make a lot of antioxidants through glutathione, right? Glutathione is a tripeptide, meaning three amino acids to make it, right? Glutamine, glycine, cysteine. NAC is a really important precursor to it, really important building block to it. So it plays a very powerful role. So if you're a carnivore, you know, going more to the meat side, you're going to be able to get good oxidative support through glutathione. But if you can get some other nutrients in there, that's great. Unless you're really having a lot of gut irritation and you just can't do it. Let me grab a couple other questions here for y'all. Connection H. pylori and psoriasis only, let's see here, quite, uh, H. pylori and psoriasis only thing that can, came back on my GI map was H. pylori. Yeah, I mean, H. pylori is a strong one. It's, it's a lot of connections to autoimmunity and H. pylori can affect acid and enzyme production. So that makes a lot of sense. Barb writes, and I use your MitoSynergy product. I had great results. What's the magical ingredient in the MitoSynergy? Uh, it's really helpful. Oh yeah, so it just has all the nutrients you need for mitochondrial function. So the big ones are gonna be things like creatine and ribose. That's like instantaneous fuel. So if you're like you're an exerciser, which I know you are, Barb, that's gonna help with a lot of more instantaneous energy. So creatine and ribose, instantaneous energy. Obviously carnitine plays a big role because you need carnitine. It's called the carnitine shuttle. You shuttle fatty acids into your mitochondria to get burned. That's a big one. And then, of course, just simple good quality B vitamins. And good. there's also some antioxidants in there. There's resveratrol and curcumin, which do have that antioxidant effect that I mentioned earlier. So good feedback on that. Thank you. Are canned organic veggies okay in a pinch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably even better would be frozen, but absolutely. Um, ideally, fresher the better. But... You know, you got to do your best sometimes. And if someone's even on a budget, like when I was in school, I was doing a lot of frozen veggies. Now, I would try to get some that would be organic and fresh, but then anything outside of three or four days, I would do frozen. And if you're not eating your vegetables more on the fresh side, ideally go to the grocery store twice a week if you can. That way, any of the vegetables, you know, in those first three days, you're eating them and then ideally you repeat. And then if not, you can freeze to have some good options like that. And of course, your meats are pretty easy to freeze, things like that. Great questions, guys. Okay, does the O test tell you what's going on in your stomach or if your mitochondrial power is insufficient? Yeah, there's a section on there for mitochondrial function that's very helpful that'll look at B vitamins. There's also a section on there that'll look at um, fatty acid oxidation, which is helpful. And marker seven through 14 on the Genova oat will also look at like mitochondrial function like citrate, isocitrate, isoconitate, a lot of different markers there, very helpful. But again, you got to also look at what the root cause is. So when I see these markers, I'm never like, oh, you need this B6. I'm always thinking, well, okay, is there a stress component? Is there a genetic component? Is there an absorption component? I'm always thinking about the root cause components. Very important. Is it okay to eat quality grass-fed beef daily? Is it okay? Um, I eat it very often and feel great. I have no problem with that. I think it's always good to kind of rotate your meat, though, in general. So chicken, fish, beef, pork, lamb, like have a rotation component. I wouldn't eat things too many days in a row just because if you love it, rotate it. You don't want a food allergen. But in general, yeah, I mean, having it a couple days in a row, if it's good quality and your digestion's great, I don't see a problem with that. 
What's the main factor to consider in order to avoid SIBO relapse? I would just say make sure you're eating good foods that you can tolerate. Make sure you're relatively infection-free and make sure you can break down that food. I think the biggest relapse factor with SIBO is you're not breaking down your food adequately and maybe there's an infection that was unresolved. That'd probably be the big one. Great question. Okay, good question. Eating meat every day but can't afford organic 60% of the time. Anything you can do to help the bad stuff that comes from conventional meat? Well, I mean, there's different gradations of meat. So like since Whole Foods bought Amazon, you can get high quality organic meat at very cheap prices these days. Especially you go to Costco, Sam's Club. There's all kinds of options. So you can always do ground beef. It's always a good option. I mean, I see it at Whole Foods um, for five, six dollars a pound. So you can always do that. And usually if you do three, three pounds or more, you can get a family pack on it. Um, chicken thighs are also really good. Skipjack tuna is really good if you're in a pinch. Um, buy the avocados in bulk. You know, shop at Costco. Those are some really good options. And then you can always get some of the organic frozen vegetables as a good option for you as well. And then if you can't do organic, right, like in, in Whole Foods options, it's like step five is like pasture fed, grass fed, like everything. Step four is still organic. And then step two is like probably a good in between. And then you can always do like free range. That's also a good option too. Great questions. But I did it living in San Francisco, um, getting a stipend of, I think, what, $15,000 a year to live. And I literally had not one extra dollar to my name at the end of the month. I had to budget everything and I was still able to eat organic. I just did a lot of the things I mentioned, right? Chicken thighs, skin on, three, you know, shopped at Costco a little bit, got some frozen veggies, mm, got the free range eggs versus the full organic eggs, right? So I kind of saved a couple of bucks there. So just make good decisions. Just remember though, you will pay, you know, you're going to pay either, either way, right? If it's a short-term pinch because you're working and you're, you're working your way up or you're in school, fine, short-term pinch. But if it's your whole life, you really want to look at prioritizing more to your food over time, right? If you look at Michael Pollan's book, I think it's In Defense of Food, he talks about in the U.S., 50 years ago, we used to prioritize 18% of our income towards food. Now we actually prioritize nine so we've decreased the amount that we're willing to invest in food significantly. So in general, make sure everyone's working towards higher quality nutrition because you're either going to pay the doctor later with chemotherapy or heart disease or other expensive drugs, or you pay now with better food and better quality of life. So just do your best. Use some of those tips and tricks that I mentioned. That'll be very, very helpful. And I use Instacart a little bit because I can shop multiple stores. I can shop natural grocers. I can shop, I can shop um, you know, Randall's, Kruger's. Whole Foods, I can just shop a bunch of stores so I can see kind of what the best prices are, which is super helpful. And then if you're at Whole Foods, obviously that Amazon Prime credit card getting 5% back isn't bad either, right? Okay, excellent. Are there any chewing gums that are all right with those candida? I'm making sure to stay clear of sugar. Yeah, you could do Spry. Look at Spry. That's a xylitol-based one. That should be okay. If someone's burping two to three hours after eating but took HCL and digestive during the meals and has no gut infection, does it mean more HCL is needed? Maybe. I would ratchet up more enzymes in HCL. Make sure you're not overly hydrating with your food. Uh, didn't you do a podcast about exercising for adrenal and thyroid issues? I want to be active but sometimes tire out easily. Yeah, go look for that podcast. But in general, make sure you feel better afterwards than when you started. Make sure you can emotionally repeat what you're doing. You're not so depleted where you couldn't do it again. And then that next day, you don't feel like you're hit by a bus or overly sore, barring movements are relatively similar. All right, excellent. Uh, will functional medicine ever combine with the fecal transplant in the future? I mean, I think fecal transplants can be a helpful vehicle. I've seen some people do well with them and some do terrible. So I think it's a mixed bag. I think the fecal transplant does not fix the underlying issue of how you got there. In some people, it can be very palliatively... Um, beneficial, like they feel a lot better after it. Some I've seen worse. So it, it's back and forth, right? It's back and forth. We always want to look at, okay, are we addressing the root cause? And if we're doing something palliative, right, it's just fixing symptoms. Hey, let's just make sure the side effects aren't too bad. Oh yeah, tooth update. I'll give you guys a feedback on it. I actually had to have a root canal procedure. The infection was too deep and I couldn't knock it out but I'm gonna have my root canal doctor actually come on. I was able to find the cutting edge technology that used lasers after the root canal to clean out the tooth. So I was able to find someone that's using this newer technology with the laser. The infection was just so far up and once you have an infection up there, it's hard to get after it. Now the tooth was compromised 20 years ago. It cracked when I was a teenager eating crap, right? So I didn't have a great diet back then. So it was compromised, it had a crown for a while. And then because of that, there was instability in the tooth. And then just 20 years of pounding, it, um, 
an infection kind of got up through a crack way up in the jaw. So I had to do it. I had two options, which was to get it pulled. The problem is way in the back there, it was going to have to have bone grafts and it was going to take a lot longer and there was going to be more trauma. And just looking at it, the root canal made the most sense at the time. It still does now. The big thing I was concerned about is sealing up the root, sealing up that canal and having lots of bacteria get trapped in there. That's when all the little microtubules. Now the newer technology, there's, a, there's two newer technology. There's a different, there's a, a Yurg laser and there's a technique that's called gentle wave that uses a fluid vibrational um, methodology. So I researched both of those techniques and interviewed a couple of doctors on it and I found the one that made the most sense to me which was the laser. I liked it the best. And it really cleaned that tooth out. We filled it up, no problem. And I, I have no other dental issues besides that. I'm really taking a lot of vitamin K2 right now, a lot of cod liver oil, a lot of vitamin A, a lot of uh, bone matrix compounds to really help uh, my dental health right now, I'm trying to make it. But I felt amazing. So, I mean, the, I will tell you one thing when it comes to a tooth infection, the pain that you have in a tooth infection is excruciating. It's hard to function. Um, and it was pretty darn bad. I was needing 16 ibuprofen to keep the pain down. And again, I have some homeopathic stuff. I have some liposomal curcumin. I wet willow bark. So I try to tap out of all that stuff first. And there wasn't uh, a problem. Um, so in general, yeah, cavitations. Uh, I don't think they're that big of a deal. The cavitations, like it's the um, it's the envelope or the membrane that's that's there when a tooth is pulled. So you only have a cavitation when a tooth is pulled. A lot of times the body can reabsorb it. Sometimes it can't. Now there's a doctor Nunnally in Marble Falls in the Austin area where I'm at that's very helpful and and, and specialized in that. And you can get a comb beam to look at that or, or culture to see if that's an issue. Uh, I've had patients do it. Evan did it as well. My colleague. And he felt a little bit better, but it wasn't a deal breaker. So I always tell people, go after the low-hanging fruit. Like I put cavitations way over in this category over here where it's something to look at down the road if you're not getting amazing feedback. Yeah, so I'll talk about, yeah, the two big options when you have an infection like that is you can do things like supplemental stuff like ozone or lasers, which are helpful like early on. The problem is once you start feeling pain, a lot of times there's, there's, there's infection up there and it's hard to get at it. That's the problem because there's such poor blood flow up there. So then you pretty much, you have a root canal, right? You have a root canal plus these cutting edge options like I mentioned with the lasers or the gentle wave technique, right? Or you have a implant and you pull it out. Now, once you have an implant, there's other issues you have to worry about, like um, doing bone grafts if there's not enough material to screw the screw into in your jaw, and then also choosing hypoallergenic material, whether it's a, a zirconia screw or a zirconia um, actual mold on the tooth. You want to choose biocompatible material. I like zirconia. It's a great material. Um, um, yeah, zirconia. And then you can also do the Clifford sensitivity test to actually test how your body responds to that. Excellent. Yeah, so Liz, I wouldn't worry about, um, I would not worry about anything with cavitations right now. I don't think it's a priority. But things that you can do in the meantime, just to keep good dental health is have a really good toothpaste. I like the Revitin toothpaste or the Biocidin toothpaste or the Xylowate are great. And I'll also do oil pulling a couple times a week with some doTERRA on guard essential oils. That's very helpful to just kind of pull out any toxins and really keep my mouth clean. I also do a little flush every day with hydrogen peroxide, 3%. You can dilute it with water if you're a little more sensitive. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's little video here. If you did, put your comments down below. Smash that like button. Really appreciate you guys engaging with me all. You guys have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Oh, also, you want to reach out below. Links below. Click schedule with myself. I'm available worldwide if you want to dive in deep for more natural health, functional medicine support. Take care. Bye now.